Thank you very much. Uh, we are very pleased to have with us here um, a leading uh, economist, uh, someone who is bringing a new thinking in the field of economic theory and practice, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Stephanie Kilton. She has just written a book that was released exactly two weeks ago. The title of the book is The Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory and How uh, to Build a Better Economy. We are very honored to have you with us here today, uh, Professor Kelton. Good morning, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you for having me. We are very pleased and we are very honored to have you in this program only two weeks exactly after your book has been released. How would you, should we introduce you to the African le uh, viewers and readers? I'm a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University, which is located on Long Island in the state of New York. Um, I've been here for a few years, and before that, I was a faculty member at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. I taught there for 17 years. Uh, I served as the chief economist to the Democrats on the U.S. Senate Budget Committee for a period of time in 2015 and part of 2016. I've been an advisor to the Bernie Sanders presidential campaigns, and I'm currently serving uh, as an appointee on the economic task force for um, the Sanders-Biden unity uh, task force for the Biden campaign. Thank you very much, Professor Kelton. Uh, we are here today with you with something new that could be summarized in three letters. MMT, Modern Monetary Theories. How did you shift from, say, so to speak, ordinary economy and ordinary monetary policy to the modern monetary theory? How well, was you know, your journey? I studied economics um, as, as an undergraduate, and then I went off to graduate school. I started studying uh, economics at Cambridge University. Um, and I really had a, a fairly conventional training in economics up until that point. And then I won a fellowship through Cambridge University, and that took me to the Levy Economics Institute, which is a public policy institute or a think tank in upstate New York. And that, that's the first time I really encountered some of the kind of core ideas that um, became part of what now we call MMT. And, you know, the ideas came to me, um, not from an economist, really, but from someone who had worked in financial markets. And he had a different perspective. He had a different way of thinking about the economy. He had a different way of thinking about the monetary system and government finance and the financial operations. And, you know, I uh, encountered his work and I um, initially I thought, well, this is so different, right, from everything I've been trained to think and understand about things like money and taxes and deficits and the national debt. Um, it didn't feel right at first, but there was something about it that was so compelling uh, in the way that he explained his thinking. And so I just started investigating on my own. And eventually I managed through research and, and writing to, um, change my way of thinking about a lot of things. And basically it comes down to recognizing how the monetary system changed really after 1971. So we had the Bretton Woods um, system in place, which was a system of fixed exchange rates where you know, 44 countries came together after World War II and agreed to fix the value of their currencies to the US dollar. And the U.S. government, for its part, uh, agreed to convert the U.S. dollar into gold at a fixed price. And that was the monetary system we had for a number of years, but we don't have it anymore. And so once I started to understand what that meant, you know, moving to a, a floating exchange rate, a fiat currency, and then thinking about what that implies in terms of how government can now orient fiscal and monetary policy to build the best domestic economy possible, taking advantage, full advantage of the monetary system, I realized that 
we had been underperforming. We had been running our macroeconomic policy in a lot of ways as if we were still on a gold standard and hamstrung by the old set of rules when in fact there is a great deal more that we could be doing to take fuller advantage of the monetary system, to care for our communities and our people, to make the kinds of investments we know we should be making and that we have the money to do that. So it just involved a big a shift in thinking for me. In the field of economic theories, what affiliation will you put yourself through People have been talking about um, functional finance by Professor Lerner and uh, even Keynesian uh, economy. Uh, what is your affiliation? Wh where, who were are the former economists that you recognize are the, the previous leaders in this field? Yeah, there are so many. I mean, I, I could give you a very long list or I could give you maybe the names of three people who, whose own work um, is informed by the work of others before. So I'll, I'll start with three. And you mentioned Abba Lerner uh, or functional finance. And, and that's obviously, um, well, or not obviously, it's important in, uh, in MMT. You know, Lerner was a contemporary of John Maynard Keynes. So Lerner uh, understood as Keynes did that the economy tends to operate chronically with a lack of aggregate demand, with a lack of effective demand. And so you always have uh, unemployment that you could be tackling through government policy. So uh, Abba Lerner is one important figure. Um, Wynne Godley, a British economist, is another important figure because Wynne sort of pioneered the work in the sector financial balance um, approach and MMT adopts and incorporates uh, Godley sector financial balances, which is to say that we recognize that the government deficit is mirrored by a financial surplus in some other part of the economy, in the non-government sector. And the last name I'll give you is Hyman Minsky. Uh, and Minsky was, I think, one of the most important economists of the last century, probably best known for his work in um, the financial instability hypothesis, understanding how economies evolve and how balance sheets evolve through time and how the financial system itself becomes more fragile and subject to crises when small events happen. Minsky also was an advocate of something he called the employer of last resort, we call a federal job guarantee. So those three together, Godley, Lerner, and Minsky, um, fill out a lot of, but not all of, MMT. Uh, Professor Stephanie Kelton, MMT has been there more or less uh, for decades, but you are one of the ones who, uh, who are reviving it these days. How is it that uh, a silence was kept on it for so long? No, you need people um, to pay attention to you and then you need people to start writing and talking about the work that you've been doing. So I think you're right that it did take a very long time to get the work out of sort of the academic journals. I mean, this is the usual pathway for economists is to, you know, perform research, to write up that research in the form of, uh, you know, academic papers, to put those papers through a peer review process and you wait a period of time and they get published in a journal that's not widely available. You know, these things are usually by subscription only. So the ideas are sort of contained in a, in a small network of people who read academic journals. Uh, and it's very hard to make, to popularize those ideas. And so while we did that work and we have, you know, hundreds or even maybe thousands of publications as a group of scholars, um, it wasn't really until journalists and people in the finance community really started paying attention to the work and then uh, writing about it, you know, in popular forums and talking about it. So I think that was sort of part of the breakthrough for us. And also, you know, probably to some extent, um, my time in the Senate and um, being involved with the presidential campaign probably also helped to push the ideas forward. We thank you very much for leading this uh, MMT movement here. Now, let us come to your book. Let us consider the title. It's already puzzling, The Deficit Myth. In fact, there are six myths. 
and you're going after each of these myths and tackling them in a very original way. And it may seem paradoxical to many of people, given the thinking that have been uh, widespread in the population. If you agree, Professor, let us start by the first myth. The first myth you'd say that the government budget should look like a household budget. That's why people think. They say, you as a household, balance your budget. People say, oh, the government, please balance your budget. And you say, no, 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 this is a myth. It is, it's, please explain it to us and to the ordinary people. Finances that we're all most familiar with are our own. And so when we hear somebody say that the government should manage its own budget and its own finances, like a household must manage its finances, we say, yeah, that makes sense, right? Uh, except it doesn't make sense. Uh, the federal government in a country like the US, or I say in the book, like Australia or Canada, the Japan, the UK, these are all what we can call currency issuing governments. They have a sovereign currency, okay? They define their own currency. They call it a dollar or a yen or a pound. Um, and then they tax and borrow only in a currency that they and only they can issue. So the government in the United States of America, the US government is the issuer of the dollar. And that means that it can never run out of money. It can never have bills coming due that it can't afford to pay, unlike a household, right? Households can run out of money. Households can go broke. Households can have debt that they don't have the cash flow to be able to make the payments. The federal government is different. And the key distinction I make in that chapter is the distinction between the issuer of the currency and the user of the currency. So I'm a currency user. So I have to go out and get the dollar in order to spend the dollar. The federal government is the issuer. They have to spend the dollar before anybody can have the currency, right? So uh, makes a big difference. Yes, as you are debunking this first myth and bringing us to reality, how is it that such a self-evident reality has not been popular and is not put into practice in public policy? Well, sometimes it is put into practice, but nobody explains it quite that way, right? Like, so right now, Congress in the US and governments around the world, Australia and the UK, are committing to spending vastly more than they had originally intended to be spending in the year 2020 because of the coronavirus pandemic and the economic fallout. We will come so back to it later. are in yes. fact stepping up and behaving the way that I just described, like a currency issuing government. They aren't raising taxes in order to collect money to spend fighting the coronavirus and, and helping ailing economies. They're just spending the money. But the... The thing is that we don't normally explain it that way, okay? Normally, we pretend like the government is supposed to budget like a household. And so we hear politicians talk about wanting to spend money on programs, but then asking, how will we pay for it? And as soon as they start asking, how will we pay for it? They're sort of back in that household frame where they're looking for the money, they're trying to raise revenue in order to be able to spend like a household would need to do. There are many implications of what you've just said, that since the government is a sovereign in the system of fiat currency, there is the risk. And this comes come to your sec the second myth, uh, because there is, isn't there a risk of overspending? And for you, there is no such a risk. You say deficits? Because in the second myth, the second myth you are attacking is that myth that also is widespread and it's thought in uh, economic courses. It is that deficits are evidence of, uh, of uh, overspending. And you say this is a myth and you, you don't agree with it and you come with a counter reality to this myth. Please. Well, okay. So at first I would say that there is a risk of governments overspending. That can happen. Um, but what I'm, the myth that I'm um, pushing back against in this chapter is the idea that a de deficit itself is evidence that the government has overspent. So I say that is not the case and we shouldn't think like that. We should recognize that evidence of overspending is inflation, not a deficit itself. Okay, we have deficits and very big ones in the U.S. right now. The deficit is going to be something like $4 trillion this year. But it's not evidence of overspending 
because those deficits aren't creating economic problems, right? They're not creating inflationary problems in the economy. So those are very good deficits. We, those deficits are helping to support incomes and to support the economy right now. In fact, if anything, they're probably um, still quite, uh, quite a bit too small. They, they should be bigger. Um, so the, the purpose of that chapter is to remind us that uh, as long as the economy can safely handle additional spending, that is, you know, without creating inflationary problems, then the spending itself is not problematic. Inflation is the relevant constraint. But the problem here is what, by this uh, safely handling the spending. So what, how do you safely handle the spendings? Is there not a risk of overspending if there is no uh, anything that will guide this spending and you yourself, you're admitting that there's a problem and there is the risk of overspending? It is easy to formulate it, but how do you put it in practice? And how will you advise policymakers in this regard? Oh, okay, so right now Congress is passing legislation and governments around the world are passing spending bills. So we've already committed here in the US to spending trillions of dollars. We have a house and we have a Senate. The house has already passed another spending bill this one would be three trillion more dollars on top of what's been done. The Senate hasn't taken that up yet, so it's, it's being held up. But let's suppose that the Senate passed that bill and authorized another three trillion in spending. My position is that right now, because the US economy is so depressed, because unemployment rate is so high, because businesses are you know, um, struggling to find customers as, as the economy begins to reopen and so forth, we could safely handle three trillion of additional dollars. What does it mean to safely handle that spending? It means that when the government spends another dollar into somebody's pocket, and they have that dollar and they can go out and get a haircut or go to the grocery store or put gas in the car or you know buy a new pair of tennis shoes if the economy has the capacity to supply the food the gasoline the tennis shoes without raising prices then that is safe spending right it's only if you pass too many bills authorizing too many trillions as the economy recovers and you run out of idle capacity, you run out of um, the ability to produce more to meet higher demand, then you're gonna create bottlenecks in your economy, you're gonna get some inflationary pressure. But look, every dollar that government spends is a new dollar that exists in the economy. And then that dollar will travel around, it will change hands, it will chase after some goods and services, and when the government ultimately taxes it back, the dollar dies, okay? It's removed from the system. So the question is, how much can the economy keep up with in terms of producing more goods and services to satisfy demand while that dollar travels around the economy before we reach full employment? And so the limit really for Congress is to recognize that as the economy recovers and gets back to something that looks closer to full employment, that it can stop passing additional legislation, right? You don't need to continue to try to stimulate the economy once the economy has recovered. Yes, yes. as you're speaking like that, um, it sounds more or less like old Keynesian policy of the 60s or the early 70s. Will you agree with such a statement? Well, I, I will agree that MMT recognizes, as Abba Lerner did, that unemployment exists because of a lack of effective demand. That's what Keynes would have told us. And that uh, a way to tackle the problem is through the use of fiscal policy. But look, you know, Keynesians have, by and large, for the last at least two to three decades, leaned in a different direction. They have favored the use of monetary policy over the use of fiscal policy to try to address problems like unemployment, uh, a lack of aggregate demand in the economy and managing inflation risk. And so they really would rather see the central bank deal with this problem. They would agree that, you know, once the central bank gets interest rates very low, then it's time to turn to fiscal policy to address the problem. 
problems. MMT is different, right? We don't believe that monetary policy is an effective, uh, reliable policy tool. We would prefer to see fiscal policy primarily used to steer the economy, not just in times of crisis when interest rates are low and the central bank has done about all it can, but in normal times as well. So MMT is not just uh, standard conventional Keynesian economics, but in a moment like this, we, are, we both agree, Keynesians and MMT economists, that fiscal policy has to play a, a leading role. Let us pass to the third myth, which for me was quite strange, because uh, the third myth, according to, to your book, is a myth that say one way or another, we all on the hook in terms of the debt. That you have these calculations uh, that are posted in the streets. Oh, every Americans, you are the, because of the government debt. You every Americans calculated. You have thousands of of debt that you are going to pay it, or you are going to pass it to your the future generations. And you say no, Professor Kelton, come and say no. Forget about all this thing. This is myth. How will you convince people that it is a myth and that you are coming with another reality which is more in line with what a better economy should be? Well, look, I think, and I say this in this chapter, I think that what we have is not a debt problem or a debt crisis. What we have is a communications problem. We should not be referring to the outstanding stock of U.S. Treasuries as the national debt. It's just the wrong thing to label it. It's the wrong description. The, the stockpile of treasuries that exist today, the thing we call the national debt, is really nothing more than part of the net U.S. money supply. Okay, They're interest-bearing dollars. That's what they are. And they were put there over a period of you know, our history because the government spent more dollars into the economy then it taxed back out and it allowed those dollars to be turned into U.S. Treasuries. Okay, that's all that's happened. So if the government has a budget deficit and it spends $100 into the economy and it only taxes $90 back out, it has left $10 somewhere in the economy. Okay, the government's deficit makes a financial contribution to some other part of the economy. Now, it could just leave those $10 sitting in somebody's hands, leave them on their balance sheet, but it doesn't do that. It chooses to take those dollars back away from people and replace them with U.S. treasuries. Now, treasuries are interest-bearing currency, and that's a perfectly fine thing to do. It allows somebody who already had money to have more money because they get the currency plus the interest on top of it. Uh, and that's a choice that the government has made. We don't have to do that, um, but there's nothing inherently risky or, or dangerous about allowing a portion of the money supply to be held in interest-bearing form. And that's really all that's going on. There's nothing to pay back later. There's, it's already been, the spending has already been paid for. It's just that we chose to pay for part of the spending with interest-bearing currency. And that's really all that's happened. No, they are here a, a, a social problem and it is right that you started by mentioning the communication problem because of the anxiety among the people, the anxiety that the media have been producing and people are very afraid, oh the government deficit is too large, we have every American is going to pay 50,000 of, of debt, so how do you cool down this anxiety because it is a real problem within the, the society? I wish I had the ability to cool, to you know cool the national temperature and change the entire uh, discourse on my own. I don't. But what I would uh, I guess a step in the right direction is to get journalists and reporters and politicians to change the language that they use when they communicate with the population about what's really going on. It would be helpful if some of our um, federal agencies, you know, if the Congressional Budget Office, which publishes the long-term budget outlook instead of, you know, using words like deficit and debt, if they would communicate differently, you know, they could just as easily replace the word deficit or fiscal deficit with non-government surplus throughout the publication, throughout the report, and people would have a very different feeling. Don't use national debt, use 
you know, currency, uh, interest bearing currency or part of the net money supply or, you know, give this thing another name um, because that would go, I think, a long way toward helping people kind of, you know, reduce the level of anxiety that we create. Professor Kelton, has you assessed, or, you know, any way um, the implication in the purchasing power of the US dollar of MMT? Well, I don't think there is one. I mean, MMT is a description of how the monetary system works and how government finance operations work, right? How the government spends, what is the purpose of taxes? What role does do bond sales play? How does it work with the treasury and the Fed? So it's a description of the system we have. So there is no inherent implication for the value of the currency. The question is, with that understanding of how the system works, what might a future Congress do? Now, just look back in time, right? We had a financial crisis in 2008. Congress responded um, with legislation that increased the deficit. We had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. They called it the Obama stimulus. And that committed a little less than a trillion dollars uh, in spending. And that the deficit increased, but the deficit increased also because the economy was so weak, right? We had a very sharp downturn and the debt increased and people got very anxious at the time. They said, oh, this is terrible. This is going to require higher taxes in the future. We're not going to be able to, um, you know, fund programs and all that kind of stuff. And then what happened? You know, the Republicans get elected after President Obama. We have Trump. The Republicans are in the Senate. They're in the House. They pass huge tax cuts massively increasing deficits, adding to the national debt. People said, oh, this is terrible. This means we're never going to be able to spend. We won't be able to afford things in the future because the Republicans just created all this, you know, new debt and so forth. And then what happened? Coronavirus. And Congress is passing trillions of dollars of new spending. So the point is, we have been running deficits and some pretty big deficits in response to crises like the financial crisis and the coronavirus, and also just for fun, because the Republicans wanted to pass tax cuts. And that has not led, none of that has led to a sharp decline in the value of the dollar. The dollar remains strong. Investors around the world want to hold uh, our currency. And so there is no inherent relationship between the way the government uh, has operated its budget thus far, even with some pretty big deficit spending, and the implications for inflation and the value of the currency. Dollars remain strong. As you were just answering, you mentioned taxes for the first time. And to what uh, I feel reading your book, in terms of government spending, you put taxation not at the highest level as people it used to be. And it, this is a strange, and this is also part of what you call a, a, a paradigm ch change. Because ordinary people would think that it is through taxation that government should be able to, to manage its business. But I don't know if I heard you perfectly uh, the, when I read your book. Do you mean that taxation is no more is no, or, or let it put it like way, is no longer important. Oh no, taxes are important. Um, and I, I think I give at least four reasons in the book why taxes are important. They're not important because the government needs our money in order to spend. And that's the key um, point, I guess, in MMT is to recognize that the government is not revenue constrained. It doesn't need to get dollars from the rest of us in order to have the capacity to spend its own currency. Uh, that, that's an important point. So recognizing that, then the question, so why does the government bother taxing at all? And in the book, I tell a, a little bit about how you could start up a currency from scratch. If you, if you were trying to monetize an economy that wasn't previously monetized, taxes are a, a, a pretty efficient way to go about introducing a currency for the first time. So you can give value to the currency, to an otherwise intrinsically worthless token, simply by requiring people to um, pay a tax to you or other fines or fees uh, to the government. So I talk about that in the book. 
The other important thing, or another important thing taxes do, is that they help to regulate inflationary pressure. If the government always just spent its currency and never collected anything back again, that is a recipe for disaster. That is a recipe for uh, high or even hyperinflation, right? You have to regulate the amount of currency that is available to chase after goods and services in the economy. So when I said before that every time the government spends, it gives birth to a new dollar, okay? A dollar is born, and now that dollar is in someone's hands and it can travel around the economy. And you know, some government worker can use that dollar to buy groceries, and then the grocer can use the dollar to pay the, um, the worker, and then the worker can use the dollar to pay their rent, and then the landlord can use the dollar to buy gasoline. You see, so that dollar is chasing around goods and services in the economy until the government taxes it back. And then that is the death sentence for the dollar. That, and, and so the trick is to regulate the difference between how many dollars you are spending into the economy and how many you are subtracting away through taxes so that you don't have excessive money creation and spending in the economy creating inflationary pressures. Then taxes are important for distribution and for, you know, creating incentives and disincentives and that sort of thing as well. The myth number four in this wonderful book, the book titled The Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory and the How to Build a Better Economy. In this book, which is really, uh, we recommend it, which is fantastic, written, or very well written, and we can read it and even if you're not an economist by profession, it is possible for ordinary lay people to understand. The fourth myth that you're tackling is this one. It is a myth that also is widespread and it said that uh, government deficit crowds out private investment and by doing that making the, the population poorer. And you come and Professor Kelton comes and say no, 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 this is a myth. So this is a reality. Where is the reality? So look, imagine that there is a pile of dollars somewhere in the world and those dollars have been put there by savers. People who had dollars but didn't want to spend everything they had so they saved some and they put them in a great big pile. And the story that we're told is that those savings are available to people who wish to borrow. Now some of the people who want to borrow are households, some of the people who want to borrow are businesses, some of the people who want to borrow are governments. And so this myth is about telling us that if governments are running larger deficits, that that requires them to borrow more. And so they have to gobble up a bigger share of the available supply of dollars, leaving behind fewer dollars to finance everybody else, okay? Yeah. So now businesses don't have the financing they need mm -hmm. to invest in new capital equipment and so forth. So this myth tells us that deficits are bad because government deficits crowd out private investment. They elbow the other guy out of the room and that business doesn't have access to the dollars that he needs or it needs to make investments which are assumed to be more productive than government spending so that over time you get a less dynamic, slower growing economy, lower productivity, uh, lower future prosperity and that sort of thing. So in this chapter, I just remind people that can't possibly be true because government deficits themselves don't gobble up savings in the rest of the economy, they augment them, they increase them. Remember, if the government is engaged in uh, running a fiscal deficit, it means it's spending more dollars into the economy than it is subtracting away. And that obviously means that it's adding to the number of dollars that are outside the government. And once the government sells the treasuries, the borrowing piece, the government is just trading in those dollars that it put in the economy for treasuries after the fact. So that's all that's happening there. The fifth one was a surprise to me because um, conventional uh, economy th uh, teaches how you have to balance your trade, you have to export more than you import. But you come and you say that trade deficit People looking at trade deficits as if America was losing is a myth also. So are you against the exports 
And are you in favor of import or in favor of trade deficit in the U.S.? So can you please elaborate in this? So again, I think that this word deficit is part of the problem. Once you attach the word deficit to something, it sounds like somebody's done something wrong, right? And the trade deficit, the, the President Trump believes that the U.S. is losing at trade. And the evidence that we're losing is the fact that we have a trade deficit. So he sees dollars leaving the U.S. because we buy more goods and services from the rest of the world than they buy from us. And so he pays attention to money and cash flows. That's what interests him. So he sees the trade deficit and he thinks that means China's taking all of our money or Japan is taking all of our money. And MMT says, well, hang on, there's another way to look at this, right? Just like there's another way to look at fiscal deficits, there's another way to think about the trade deficit. So the trade deficit, which we tend to think of in money terms, in financial terms, is also in real terms, our stuff surplus, right? So in exchange for the dollars that we pay to China or to Japan, um, we are importing, we are getting net importing the cars and the high tech and the manufactured goods, right? Those are coming to us. So in real terms, imports are a benefit and exports are a cost. Think about it. You put your people in factories, they work all day long, they manufacture things, and then they put them in a container, load the container on the ship and send it to somebody else to consume. The, the imports are the benefit in real terms, right? So MMT is in a sense agnostic as to um, whether, the trade, uh, but whether the trade balance is positive or negative. We just wanna explain more clearly what's actually happening and recognize that not every country can be a net exporter. You know, For one country to have a trade surplus, somebody's got to be running a trade deficit. We can't all have trade surpluses. And it turns out that um, the U.S. Is, has run persistent trade deficits for decades. And those trade deficits are a source of dollars to many other countries in the world, many of whom, uh, for whom it's a critical lifeline. And I talk in the book about, you know, countries that don't have the same, um, sort of luxury or freedom that the US has with respect to its trade balance. We can sustain trade deficits and pretty big ones. Uh, and a lot of countries around the world can't. They need to net export to earn the dollar in order to get the currency that they need to buy critical imports, food, medicine, technologies, energy, that sort of thing. Professor Kelton, you've said something that strikes me and somehow shocked me. I, I want to make sure that I heard you properly. Uh, have you said that import is a good thing and that export is a bad thing? Well, what, I, what I'm saying is that some countries don't have much room to choose, right? For a lot of developing countries, uh, they need to export. They need to put their people to work making uh, things that they sell to the rest of the world because they need a currency that they can use to buy critical imports. So they just don't have the same freedom of choice that countries like the US, for example, have. But it is true that um, every time you build something or manufacture something, a service, whatever it is you provide, if you don't keep it and consume it domestically, uh, you are releasing some real benefit to someone else in some other part of the world, right? Your exports become benefits to the importing country. That is, the, that is true. But the, your capacity of exporting in the long run will improve your capacity to produce different goods. But if you are not able to compete and export, how are you going to, to improve and to in, enlarge your capacity of producing goods and services. Yeah, so for a lot of countries, this is a, a long-term development uh, issue, right? You've got to be able to begin to transition, to make the investments in the domestic economy that open up the policy space for your individual country so that you aren't reliant on the rest of the world for critical imports. That's a tough thing for some countries. It's gonna take years or even decades 
to make those investments, to become energy independent, to become food independent, right? To develop. Uh, so, you know, it's not an easy problem to solve for many countries. And this is where the rest of the world can play, I think, an important role. And I talk about this in the book in terms of providing aid and assistance and, and helping developing countries. Because what we've ended up with is a situation where um, too many developing countries just stay developing countries and they aren't able to get to the point where they become developed economies. And I think there's a lot the international community can do to um, aid and assist countries that, you know, if you just leave them to their own devices, will continue, um, you know, extracting whatever natural resources they have and, you know, selling them to the rest of the world in exchange for a currency that just allows them to provide the bare subsistence for their populations. And we'd like to see countries do much, much better than that. What you have just said about uh, this uh, uh, fifth myth, don't you think that is quite unique in the world to the United States, given the dollar status? I'm not sure that Japan can do the same thing. I'm not sure that Germany, even though they are highly industrialized country, even China, are you not describing something that is absolutely unique to the status of the United States and its currency, the US dollars? No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm not suggesting that uh, every country attempt to become a net importer, that that's somehow the pathway to prosperity. There, again, there are going to have to be uh, a net export. For every net exporter, there's got to be a net importer on the other side of that, right? Um, but with respect to MMT, what I'm saying is that there are a lot of countries that have a monetary system and the fiscal capacity to run their domestic policy, their monetary and fiscal policy, to orient them toward generating full employment and sustaining full employment domestically while managing inflationary pressure. So um, that's sort of the, the goal of MMT is to help, uh, I guess, if you wanna say it this way, to help as many nations as possible recognize what the fiscal capacities of their governments are for those that have limited capacity, either because of the nature of their monetary system or because of you know, uh, certain domestic challenges with respect to you know, what it's possible to produce and export. Um, how do we increase the degree of monetary sovereignty so that countries can be as well suited as possible to care for their people? provide full employment. Thank you. The last, the last myth, this is really a big myth because they were an outcry when Obama started with the, Obama, the Obamacare. And the, these entitlement programs, there we have a, a newspaper writing articles say, oh no, this is unsustainable. Uh, social security deficit, it is unsustainable. Uh, Medicare, it is unsustainable. And you, Professor Kelton, you're coming and say, oh, please, cool down. This is sustainable. Can you elaborate and explain exactly what you mean by uh, uh, about this six myth? Social Security is a program that looks after the elderly, right? It is a retirement program, but it also provides benefits to survivors of people who paid into Social Security and also um, the disabled. Medicare is health care uh, for people 65 and older. So the government is promising to do what? To pay medical bills in the case of Medicare and to provide um, benefit payments to pay out benefits, uh, send checks to retirees, the, their uh, dependents and the disabled. So in other words, they're promising to spend dollars on these programs. So the question then is, it, could there ever be a situation where these programs become unaffordable? where the government can't come up with the money to pay the prescription drug bill that someone incurred on Medicare or to pay for their hospitalization or their primary care? Could there ever be a situation where um, you have uh, an, a senior, right, somebody who leaves the workforce, reaches retirement age, moves into retirement, and you can't afford to provide the benefits that you've promised to that person? The answer is clearly, unequivocally, no. The federal government can always afford 
to meet any financial obligation it has, provided that those payments are due in a currency that it and only it can create. So the, again, the US government can't run out of dollars. It's the issuer of the currency. It can always pay any bill that comes due as long as the bill is denominated in our currency. We're not borrowing in a foreign currency. So, um, you know, we've been focusing on the wrong thing. We can, these programs are perfectly sustainable as long as there is the political will to continue to support these programs. It cannot be a financial crisis. It can only be about whether Congress is prepared to continue to support these programs. Thank you, Professor Kelton. We are almost at the end, but let I have some very general questions. Uh, one sentence is your book that strikes me, and which I think summarizes this book is this one. And I read that uh, you say spending should never be constrained by some arbitrary target or any allegiance to what you say so-called sound finance. Would that be a good summary of your book? Yes, I think so. <laughs> okay. Now, okay. if we look in Europe, in Europe, you may be aware of the mastery criteria mm -hmm. regarding the target. I don't know where they get the figure from. They said the government debt should not be over 60% of GDP and the government de deficit should not be over 3% of GDP. What is your comment? regarding this type of criteria? Well, I actually wrote about this while I was finishing my PhD. This became part of my doctoral dissertation. Um, I, I think that uh, if I remember correctly, according to one economist, uh, they, those numbers were chosen because they were historical averages. So not a lot of thought went into that except to look at the numbers and say, well, that's about the, the historical average across these countries. So we'll just pick these numbers. Um, I think they're crazy. I think that it makes no sense to commit yourself to arbitrary fiscal targets. One, because they're depending on changing economic conditions, you might well need to be running uh, budget deficits that far exceed 3% of GDP or uh, a debt, you might need to allow the debt ratio to far exceed 60% of GDP. The other thing is, these aren't really, why set a target that you can't hit? Because if the economy goes into full meltdown, as it did after 2008, and as it's doing now in uh, many countries, the, the ratio is going to take off on its own, right? Because it's a debt to GDP ratio, which means if the denominator GDP is collapsing, the ratio is going to blow up. And so you look at Italy today and you can see that the Italian government is on path to hit a debt to GDP ratio of 160 percent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not a manageable thing when the denominator is not under your control. Right. And, and frankly, neither is the, the deficit. So the numerator also isn't under your control. So you don't want to focus on uh, the numbers that fall out of the budget box at the end of each year. You want to focus on numbers that matter. Right. Focus on the unemployment rate. Focus on real metrics. You know, what is the poverty rate? Um, orient your budget to solving real problems in your economy. And you would ideally want to be able to use the budget as a tool to achieve real meaningful goals, right? Rather than to target the budget outcome itself. The difficulty these countries have is obviously that they are operating with a currency that they can't issue. So there are differences. The subtitle of your book is quite interesting. It is Modern Monetary Theory and how to build a better economy. How will you describe a better economy and how far are we from it? Well, I mean, it's easiest for me to do this, you got a better economy. So I live in the United States, okay? And before the coronavirus pandemic, when the unemployment rate was about three and a half percent, and, you know, Donald Trump would say it was the greatest economy in the history of the world. No one's ever had a better economy. But if you look beyond that headline number, you would see that 87 million Americans, before the coronavirus, 87 million Americans 
either were uninsured or underinsured when it comes to health care. That um, 500,000 Americans sleep out on the streets every night. That, you know, uh, 40% of the population doesn't have $400 set aside for an emergency. That a half a million people file for bankruptcy, go broke every year because of medical related debt that child poverty, you know, I could go on and on, right? That, there are a lot of problems in the economy. So when I say building a better economy, I mean an economy that works for all of our people and doesn't just perform well for a, a small segment of the population at the very, very top. So we, we have a lot of deficits and I have a chapter on this in the book called The Deficits That Matter. We have a retirement crisis, people aren't prepared to retire. We have um, a student debt crisis. We've got um, $1.7 trillion in outstanding student loan debt with people struggling not just to go to school, but to then pay back the loans after they graduate. Um, you know, there are a lot of problems in the economy. And I think that the way the book is trying to point us in the direction of um, setting aside the obsession with balancing the budget and getting us to focus on rebalancing a lot of inequities and plugging a lot of holes in various parts of our economy. Uh, Professor Kelton, I thank you again. Th thank you very much. One last question relating to Africa and to development economics. You are well aware of the action of the International Monetary Funds, of the World Bank, how they have been advising it. What changes do you think that modern monetary theory could bring in terms of development economics? And if you were to advise African governments in their path to the economic development, what would you say? Because I do have uh, a chapter and much of a chapter that takes up some of this, but look, uh, and we talked about this a little bit already. I think that, you know, to the extent that it's possible, and it isn't always possible, but to the extent that it is possible to avoid borrowing in a foreign currency, I absolutely, uh, we in the MMT community, absolutely believe that governments should do everything in their power. But, to avoid but the World Bank has been working for in the 80s and 90s to diminish the role of the, the government in those countries. They lay out people, the, the uh, civil servants, they cut the government budget, they will impose this country to, help, to balance the deficits and to what you call the so-called sound, uh, sound finance. That's the issue I want, and you are bringing a new perspective. And I think it will be interesting to the, uh, the leaders in Africa to hear your voice. You are bringing a new perspective and authority, and you're sh demonstrating everything you've chosen in your book. I want you to address, please, very specifically, this World Bank policy and IMF, and to give you advice. Sorry to have interrupted you. No, that's fine. I, I think that, again, it, it is critically important to understand that when you go to the IMF, let's say, and you're borrowing in foreign currency, that um, you can expect that loan to come with a variety of strings attached. You can expect that the IMF is going to ask you to um, do structural adjustments where that means um, you're going to liberalize your capital markets, labor, you're going to relax regulations that protect industries and people and communities in your countries, that um, you're going to, you know, maybe um, renege on commitments you've made with respect to worker pensions and, and other programs that support public sector workers. You're going to lay people off. So what I'm saying is it's a bad deal in many cases. And to the extent that you're able to avoid placing yourself in a position where you go to the IMF and then you have to accept the conditions of, of the loans, try to avoid going to the IMF and allowing them to force that sort of those sort of structural adjustments and policies on your country. It's not always possible to do that, but the international community can be helpful to you in this regard. And I think, you know, look, debts that can't be paid or shouldn't be paid, we shouldn't be trying to collect on them. The international community can play a role here and there can be debt forgiveness. And we have to begin to make I think uh, a concerted effort, the wealthier advanced countries, 
to help developing countries to truly develop. And that means not keeping you attached to the IMF and the World Bank on an ongoing basis where you see them as your only lifeline and you never are able to, to make the kinds of investments in your economy that are gonna allow you to become a developed country. Uh, how do you see MMT, let's say in the coming decades? And how do you see your role in it, in particular in the academia and in the curriculum, in the teachings of economic science? Well, so I, I obviously uh, have an academic position and I get to work with graduate students and we have, um, you know, trained goodness knows how many hundreds of students who are now themselves professors of economics and chairing economics departments all across this country and beyond. So it's an important um, role that we play in continuing to educate the next generation of economists so that there are more people um, you know, in the public policy sphere and in academia who I think better understand um, the, the limits on government, what governments can do, how government finance works, the monetary system, to be able to approach uh, policy making from a more functional finance as opposed to a dysfunctional sound finance approach. Um, but also, you know, I have a role to play, I think, in terms of the public discourse, and I um, want to continue to be able to do that and to engage with people around the world, like here talking with you today. Um, and, and so I think it's critically important and the number of people who are beginning to gain a better understanding and appreciation of how it all works, I think is increasing exponentially. And I think that can um, only offer us hope in terms of where we have the potential to go as um, a global community in terms of addressing really um, significant challenges that we're all facing. You know, climate change is an, is an obvious one. Thank you very much, Professor Gelton. We really much appreciate having you with us and uh, we wish you all the best and the success in the books to spread a new language, a new view in terms of economics and how a government really performs to create what we all look, we are looking for, a better economy. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Nice to be with you. Thank okay. You.